So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you today Goodman Sebeko. He is a, a psychiatrist um, working at the University of Cape Town. He, um, I'm going to read you his bona fides and then I'll tell you a little about him personally. But, uh, Dr. Sebeko is um, the head of addiction psychiatry at the University of Cape Town within the Department of Psychiatry. His, he has an expertise in interventions with non-specialist workers for, for um, serious mental illness. Um, he has expertise on doing and uh, implementing task shifting models, task sharing models um, for treatment of harmful substance use, mental health, and HIV for, with people who are living with these conditions. He's also the co-director of the South Africa HIV Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Um, Training technology. technology. Yeah, yeah, Dan does the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> the Addiction Sorry. Technology Transfer Center. Thank you. <laughs> um, but more importantly, um, Goodman is one of the more um, impressive people I've gotten to meet in traveling the world. And uh, it's rare to meet someone who is as humble and as down to earth and brilliant at the same time as Goodman is. And uh, I know I'm richer today because I got to spend a good amount today and I get to see him again tomorrow. Um, but I'm looking forward to hear not only about his greatness as a, as a psychiatrist, as a researcher, as a clinician, as a, a community worker, but also um, what he's going to bring to us to teach us about what we might begin thinking about implementing here in Los Angeles as he talks about capacitating, capacitating non-specialists in behavioral health and HIV. Dr. Sebeko. Thank you so much, Steve, for that intro. I don't deserve that. It was way too kind. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we, we, we agreed. Stop it. <laughs> Did you tell me yes to learn how to take a couple That's minutes? <laughs> but it's a real pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invitation and uh, for all the interactions we've had so far. And uh, for everyone who's coming, everyone who's joining us, and everybody who will watch this later on uh, when it's posted. There are people online as well. Yes. Hello. Um, so, uh, I think Steve, you've done a great job of introducing who I am, so I don't have to do that for myself. Um, so I hope that this will be an insightful, um, you know, um, opportunity to listen to my experience of uh, taking work that I've done in my PhD and translating it into the field and using it uh, in a, on, a new, um, on a new platform and, and seeing where we can take it going forward. So, let's go. So I'm going to start by talking about why the focus uh, on behavioral health and HIV, again, something that probably everyone in this room is well aware of, but I think it'll serve uh, everybody who gets to watch this later on pretty well for, to get that background. And we'll talk about why we focus on non-specialist health workers and, uh, and, how to, and in what ways we've sought to capacitate them through training. And then I'll end off just by talking about the factors and the results of capacitate. So factors that have determined success in capacitating them and, and what results um, have been noted. So one thing we know is that in spite of all of the advances that have been made in South Africa with HIV, South Africa still has the high burden of HIV with one-fifth of the world's po HIV post positive population living in, in South Africa and having 15% of all new uh, global infections. Um, in spite of, of this burden, um, there are only, you know, there are 44 percent of people in South Africa are still not receiving antiretroviral therapy, in spite of ready access uh, to uh, good treatment. Um, and there are still 270,000 new infections each year, and we're still experiencing a high volume of HIV-related deaths as well. Um, what's also clear uh, through the SASH study which was conducted by uh, one of uh, my supervisors, Dan Stein and colleagues, is that while substance use patterns in South Africa match those internationally, the rates of harms in South Africa are much higher compared to other regions. And this is due to a varying um, sort of spectrum of, of, of factors, one of these being the historic DOP system in the Western Cape where people who worked on wine farms were paid in wine. And so it became a social norm. Um, and you know, the study, I feel, um, probably underestimated the, you know, the rates of use. So it found that 41% of, 5% of men and only 17% of women use alcohol. And of those, a tenth were engaged in risky or hazardous use. 
I, I think this is an underestimation, but this is what the data shows right now. And as a consequence of that DOP system and, uh, in, uh, and continuing harmful use, uh, there's a hi alarmingly high uh, prevalence of uh, fetal alcohol spectrum uh, disorders in South Africa. So what we also know is that the most prevalent class of lifetime uh, disorders uh, is the common mental disorders, which include depression, anxiety, and um, substance use disorders. We're also aware that uh, with mental health, there's a higher risk uh, amongst people who are living with HIV of having mental health uh, challenges compared to the general population. So we know that people who are less ill, who uh, have mental health challenges, are less likely to seek assistance. Now I'm blocking you. This is highly, <laughs> all right. And it, it might result in poor adherence to uh, antiretroviral therapy. But we all, what we then know as a, as a summary is that the combined effects of substance use disorders, t TB, and psychiatric disorders, these are all more common in people who are living with HIV. Um, so I, have, I hope I haven't lost yet. We'll bring this all together in the end. So we also know that people who are engaged in harmful substance use um, are, are more likely to be non-adherent uh, to ARVs and to therefore have lower CD4 counts. They're more likely to miss ARVs and missing an ARV dose is more likely to lead to uh, completely stopping taking ARVs. Um, and people who use uh, substances ha uh, harmfully are more likely to report psychological distress, which may be anxiety or depression, and also may ex uh, are like more likely to experience lower levels of uh, family support. So this, this just serves to summarize all of, the, all of what I've just said now is that, particularly in the context of South Africa where alcohol is the, is, is the main driver, although we do have some concerns as well with cannabis, uh, heroin, and methamphetamine, depending on which region of the country you're looking at, uh, in, infers increased risk behavior, increased risk of unprotected sex amongst people living with HIV, faster disease progression and depletion of CD4 cells, and poor adherence and service utilization. And we've just discussed mental health now. We also understand the strong intersecting um, evidence between uh, harmful substance use um, and, um, and HIV uh, and outcomes. So the recommendation in general, again, this is not news to anybody in this room, is that treatment of HIV, substance use, and psych psychiatric disorders requires multifaceted, uh, comprehensive, and multidisciplinary um, um, approach to achieve uh, optimal outcomes. And this includes the need for proper screening to identify those at risk or those who need further assessment and management. And screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment is one approach um, which uh, helps to address these needs. Again, not news to anyone in the room, screening really refers to assessing uh, op opportunistically quickly the severity of substance use and identifying the appropriate level of intervention, treatment, or referral. A brief intervention focuses on using those few moments that the clinician or non-specialist has with the, with the client uh, to increase insight and awareness uh, regarding the harmful substance use and helping the patient mo um, mobilize their own internal motivation for changing the harmful uh, behavior. And so brief intervention can be a combination of, uh, of, of therapies including motivational interviewing, cognitive behavior therapy, problem solving, solutions focused. Referral to treatment then, uh, self-explanatory, refers to those who are identified to be at risk being referred uh, for additional assessment and, and treatment as is appropriate. What we know as well is that in our context, well, you know, in general, there's a much lower availability of, of human resource for mental health and substance use disorders. And this is much worse in low and middle income countries. And for this reason, task shifting um, is, is an approach which uh, WHO has suggested could be a way to tackle this uh, treatment gap. And so task shifting really refers to delegating or um, shifting tasks which would normally be performed by a practitioner who is more specialized in training to less specialized cadres. And so there are multiple levels of task shifting which you'll see represented on that slide. So task, uh, level one would be from doctors to non-specialist non, non physicians. Level two would be from non-specialist physicians to nurses and all the way down. So the research has, has, has supported the fact that um, the use of task shifting or task sharing interventions has promising benefits for improving outcomes in PTSD, uh, alcohol use disorders, and patient and care outcomes for, for dementia. Um, and so there's evidence in general that it's a, it's a good approach, but I think there's a lot of work on, on ongoing to, to demonstrate additional impact for se severe mental illness and additional uh, common mental disorders. What I might perhaps clarify 
is what the difference is between task shifting and task sharing. So really task sharing wants to infer that in, in spite of the task being shifted to a less specialized worker, the specialist worker remains involved through supervision and, and creating a space that facilitates the ongoing growth and, 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 and sort of support for the cadres to whom it, there's been task shifting. So that's really the, the nuanced difference between task shifting and task sharing. But I think the two are really are somewhat interchangeable. So my PhD focused on testing out uh, uh, task shifting. So I'm going to talk about two interventions. If I go too fast, tell me. If I go too slow, tell me. Uh, the first one was we, we tested an intervention to improve adherence in mental health service users with severe mental illness. So we did a pilot randomized control trial, which was based at Falkenberg Hospital uh, in Cape Town. Um, and so we, the, the study was focused on, on, on Falkenberg Hospital and some of the clinics to which Falkenberg Hospital patients are discharged to after, after being stabilized at uh, the, um, at, the, uh, at the hospital, which is a tertiary psychiatric hospital where uh, the specialist would be, I think everybody gets it. So in terms of the RCT partic participants, we included um, adult mental health service users with severe mental illness spectrum. So that was schizophrenia, schizoaffective, schizophreniform uh, and psychotic disorder, NOS, as well as SIPD or substance induced psychotic disorder and bipolar mood disorder. Mm. Um, we excluded those who were due to GMC, uh, who had dementia or had intellectual disability, uh, as well as those who couldn't consent or were suicidal. In terms of the intervention, uh, we approached patients who were in the pre-discharge wards at Falkenberg Hospital and randomized them to intervention and treatment as usual. So treatment as usual uh, entailed discharge to sta as, as usual to, uh, to the community health centers. So, you'll receive the pre-discharge package of psychoeducation, family coming in for, in theory, uh, for psychoeducation, and, and, and then receiving your treatment and follow up in four weeks or four weeks from the last depot injectable. And then, uh, you know, so you'll be given a letter to take. So that's the standard care. Uh, as I was discussing with my colleagues earlier, part of the challenge is that that doesn't always happen as routinely as we'd like. So there's often gaps that, 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 that take place. The, the, the demand is very high on, on tertiary hospitals, psychiatric hospitals in South Africa, especially Falkenberg. So there's not always time for the multidisciplinary team to actually achieve the discharge planning that they want. So there might be a gap in psychoeducation. There might be a gap in the, the detail that's provided on discharge for the patient to be fully clear on what is, what is expected. There, there might be a gap in the family being psychoeducated about what a relapse looks like. Um, what to do when somebody seems to be having severe adverse effects and, um, and where to access assistance in the field, uh, in, in, in the community, and how to access assistance back via the facility. So these are some of the gaps that we identified. And so with the intervention, we provided a, what we called a treatment partner contracting session. What that meant is that the patient selected a caregiver who was already an existing resource for them after discharge from hospital. So this caregiver would come in, uh, we would provide them psychoeducation specific to the patient. So if the patient has bipolar disorder, we would focus on bipolar mood disorder as uh, the psychoeducation. So it was a structured and, and standardized uh, training package, uh, psychoeducation package for each disorder, each severe mental disorder. What then would follow is uh, a treatment partner contract negotiation. I think there's this expectation that if you're taking care of somebody with any illness, they, you, know, you know what to do. But what we actually discovered through this process is that uh, caregivers don't necessarily know what's expected of them. Patients don't know what they can expect from a caregiver or what is expected of them. So what we did here is we negotiated a relationship between them. We said to the patient, what do you need from this relationship? What do you need uh, to f make you feel supported and to support you when you're relapsing, to support you when you're requiring a readmission? And we went to the, to the caregiver and said, what do you need as a caregiver to help you feel supported in, in, in supporting this patient? What do you need from the patient? So don't absolve the patient of responsibility. It's a, it's a contract, it's a relationship. So at the end of this negotiation, they signed the contract to commit to relating to each other on these terms, in terms of this supportive relationship. Which, which we, so that, that was actually very welcome by all people. There's an opportunity for them to voice 
concerns, stresses, and, 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 and thoughts that they'd had for a very long time, it's not easy to support somebody with a severe mental illness. So this was an opportunity for them to vent and to listen to suggestions about how to structure a relationship in a way that's actually going to be supportive for both the caregiver and the patient. In addition to that, they received text messages um, that reminded them of their appointments at the clinic. Uh, so they, on discharge, they would receive the first text message. They'd receive the next one a week before their appointment. When they get to the clinic, the nurse has a cell phone, a mobile that has the people who are coming to the clinic that date. When the person arrives, they check them off the, off, off the mobile and set a new appointment. And when they do that, automatically an SMS gets sent to the patient to remind them of their next clinic appointment and the cycle starts again. So what we wanted to see, if you psychoeducate family and patients together so that it's, uh, you know, there's not separate rooms as it often happens, psychoeducate them together, negotiate a relationship and support them with mobile health, does it improve outcomes? Uh, both clinically and in terms of adherence behavior. So we measured acceptability. Our efficacy outcomes were adherence to first clinic follow-up, uh, relapse, which um, we note as any readmission, medication ad adherence measured by the medication adherence rating scale, and the quality of life measured by those tools, as well as symptomatic relief measured by the uh, CGI, the GAF, and the positive and negative syndrome scale. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. All right, and so in, this is just in terms of time frames of how we, we, we followed everybody up. So at initiation, we did all of those baselines, and then a three-month follow-up, there was a qualitative interview with the uh, mental health service user as well as with the treatment partner or carer. So we called P, uh, the, 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 treatment, the, the caregivers in the intervention arm treatment partners and the caregivers in the treatment as usual uh, care, as carers. And so at that point, we were able to review appointment adherence using Western Cape uses a, a, an online system to, uh, to track appointment uh, visits. So we're able to see if somebody's been at the clinic. Uh, and then we're also able to track if somebody has been readmitted. So we're able to track those using Clinicom. And we then repeated the efficacy measures to see. So at three months following this intervention, are they better? Are they taking their treatment? Uh, are they feeling supported? Then again, at nine months, we looked at readmission rates using that system again. So what you see here is we randomized only 77 people. Now, there's many reasons for that. Uh, and as is always the case, the main reason is funding. So when we started the project, we had more money. And then due to uh, circumstances, uh, that was reduced. And as a result, we were only able to randomize 42 to treatment as, uh, to intervention and 35 to um, treatment as usual. This is just to show uh, the uh, participant characteristics, and uh, you'll be able to see this, these slides um, afterwards. So what is not surprising here is people ch ch chose their moms, uh, for the most part, to be their treatment partners. And you know, moms are usually considered the natural caregivers in any case. And then you can see the spread for the rest. Um, so what's, what's clear here, again, so you know, a disclaimer is that because of the small sample size uh, and, the, and, the, and the short follow-up periods, these are not significant. But what's good to know is that they were nearing, um, sort of demonstrating an effect. So they were nearing significance. So what's clear is that the structured psychoeducation session improved uh, knowledge of diagnosis, understanding of illness, and you know, marginally understanding of the cause of illness. And, and so there was marginally, uh, you know, a demonstration that intervention there was better than treatment as usual. What's interesting is that in terms of the adherence, uh, the medication and clinic visit adherence, that didn't change so much, right? So that's very interesting. And I think, you know, the, the factors can be multiple, socioeconomic, uh, access to the facility, um, and, and other factors which are related to the community setting within which these patients find themselves. But what is interesting is that in the intervention, 11, um, 64, it sounds better if I say the percentage, 64.7% of the um, intervention group found the clinic helpful because the psychoeducation session included specific information about this is what you can ask for, this is what you can demand at the clinic, right? We have an odd society in that we are an apologetic society. We don't ask, we don't demand our services. And so once you educate people around what they can demand and what they can access, their ability to make use of services improves. And so you can see that 
uh, in, in the intervention arm, people seemed more likely to find the clinic helpful because now they knew what, it, what to expect at the clinic and what, what services would be provided for them there. Um, so this is just to show that from the, again, um, from the intervention arm that there was a sort of improved uh, impression of the session, the psychoeducation session, people remembering the session, uh, help, the feeling the session helped them understand their diagnosis versus the uh, treatment as usual arm, uh, which, was, which was the opposite. Again, you'll be able to access these. So there's just the uh, efficacy findings, which again demonstrate that we were nearing an effect, but that due to the small sample size, we weren't able to, to demonstrate. So in terms of the conclusion for the randomized controlled trial, we were able to show that it was acceptable um, and that treatment partner and psychoeducation components were feasible. So the M Health component wasn't feasible in that many of the uh, participants either lost their cell phones through theft um, or uh, the, the caregivers had to move to find a job somewhere else, so they weren't able to receive the text message and support the, the patient. We also found many patients surprisingly didn't have mobile phones. So uh, oftentimes the, the caregiver would be the one who has the mobile phone, and so if they were then relocated, they wouldn't be able to provide those reminders. Um, and the additional component is that from the facility side, uh, some facilities had phones stolen, uh, so nurses were mugged when they were going home with phones, for example, which meant that in its current form, the M Health component wasn't feasible. Um, and, and, all right, so the formula, those are the main, um, the main takeaways. So what we then did is Western Cape Department of Health came to us and said, we have all of these patients who get discharged from the hospital and we feel they're not supported in the community while we have community health workers whose job it is to provide chronic support in the community. But they're not trained in mental health, so they don't know how to identify people who have uh, mental health concerns or how to then support or assist them. So together with Western Cape Department of Health, uh, we developed a, a training curriculum to help sensitize, uh, importantly sensitize, but you know, not, to, not to make them specialists in mental health, but to sensitize them around the topics which were pertinent to that community in mental health and to see whether, when we did that, um, would it improve um, uh, confidence, attitudes, and knowledge amongst trained community health workers. Um, and so what it was, is it was a, a, a manualized, um, yes? So, Michael, mm -hmm. what is the, uh, for community health workers, what, they don't do mental health, or they traditionally didn't necessarily, weren't trained or sensitized to mental That's health. right. What, what, what were their primary? So they, 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 they received training on general chronic support, so hypertension, diabetes, um, and then just general home care. So if somebody is at home and they need support. So what community health workers will do is they'll go into the household and determine the household need. So whether it's, uh, it's wound care, um, sort of social support, somebody who helps you go to get your grant at the, at the, at the, at the, at the pay point or whatever it might be. But mental health is il inalienable but they were not able to address that because they weren't trained in that. Okay. Um, and so it was an eight session uh, manual, which uh, each session being three hours long, being, and we, we employed a quasi experiment uh, with a pre and post uh, cohort. And so I think what I, what I want to highlight here and which uh, I, I want to be the theme that you know, hopefully comes across and which I'll highlight in my uh, slide at the end is that the policymakers were involved from the get-go. So they came to us as researchers and said, this is the need we have, how do, we, uh, how do you help us meet it? And so that when we designed the curriculum, we, we accessed an existing resource. So when I say new beginnings there, there was a step-down facility from one of the tertiary hospitals in Cape Town where they had initial draft of what mental health components needed to be provided as training. So we weren't going to reinvent the wheel. We thought we'd take what has already been developed, but it was very, very scant. And so we expanded it. And through, through collaboration and, 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 and multiple uh, sets of meetings with policymakers at district, at municipal level, we were able to arrive at this final uh, draft of the manual. Um, and so again, the Western Cape Department of Health uh, wanted to get a sense of you know, how the, the manual would perform in the two uh, predominant low-income uh, populations in Cape Town, that being the African, uh, so the Tosa African, and the colored. So in, you know, in South Africa, we label a lot. 
So the, the mixed race, the colors, I don't know how to describe it. So it's not black, not white, somewhere in between. Terrible. So, um, so we, in, in terms of the, so the first draft was, was piloted in that way with that split, and so was the second draft, which then was, well, so what we did is we piloted the first draft, presented um, the findings to the districts, and were able to on, take on board suggestions from the CHWs who had sat through that training and produced the final iteration, which we then uh, um, piloted at those sites, Masnet Dane, and Opportunity to Serve. So this was the outline of the initial, um, of the final draft of the manual, again, focusing on the fact that it's about sensitizing community health workers. So we started to talk about introduction and culture. Um, what that was really about is to sensitize people to the fact that your cultural beliefs are not an indication of mental illness, right? That everybody has a different perspective based on where they come from and what their milieu was. So it's just, it was really an exploration of culture and around the cultural idioms which are predominant to get a sense of where people are in terms of how they view that. Um, and then session two, whoa, Sorry. hello to you. Um, and so <laughs> session two was about taking um, those elements that we've discussed of culture and talking about where does the line, where's the line from culture, from, from culture bound syndrome or, or, or idioms to mental illness. You know, a lot of people perceive Mental, di mental illness as a Western construct being, uh, you know, uh, forced upon non-Western communities. So what this allowed is a demonstration that the diagnosis is contextual and that it is not necessarily always done in one sitting, mm -hmm. that it takes multiple levels of investigation which include collateral, etc. But the most important thing was context. So the purpose here was not only to show that uh, you know, someone else's different culture does not infer that they, they have mental illness because they believe differently to you, but also to destigmatize mental health diagnosis, right? The DSM, the ICD. And then we then looked at those specific disorders, presenting them as case studies. Um, so session six was an opportunity to rehash all the content and then to talk about as a non-specialist worker, or as a community health worker, where do you fit? So if somebody's got depression, uh, or somebody's suicidal, what do you do, where do you fit? And, how do, you know, and then we, ref we frame that in terms of, these are the expected performance uh, outcomes that your employer has, you know, has dictated. In terms of those, and in terms of what we've spoken about, how do you see this playing out when you're in the field? And then when we speak about Mental Health Care Act, uh, so I mean, we, we weren't trying to make these people uh, specialist law specialists, right? We were trying to introduce them to all the role players in an admission. So under what circumstances does somebody walk into a hospital and say, I need help? And so that person would be a voluntary, presenting voluntarily. And what does that mean for their care? If somebody is unwell and they need assistance, but they're able to accept that maybe they need assistance, so who are the role players there? It's the family member, it's the community health nurse, and how does that process play out? Somebody's an acute danger to themselves, but they're not able to appreciate that. What are the processes that follow? So part of that is, yes, uh, sort of enlightening them to the process, but also destigmatizing the use of law, the use of, of law enforcement and, and sedation so that it's clear under what circumstances that happens and that it's for public health and not for uh, punitive purposes. Um, so with the community health workers, we did uh, the training in that setup. That was a, a training session in Masnet Dane in Strand. Uh, we measured knowledge um, and skill, confidence, acceptability, and feasibility uh, of the training. Um, it's just the characteristics. Uh, so more or less, more or less the same. A lot of teeth, teeth everywhere. So what we were able to show is that. Uh, with the training, there was a significant improvement in knowledge and confidence, and that in general, the attitudes were, were improved as well, except for authoritarianism. Um, so what that shows is that most of us still believe that people with mental illness need to be told what to do, where to go, what to eat. And because this was matched by other, other, other studies uh, which have done a similar intervention. So it seems that we still all feel very authoritarian towards um, people with, se with severe mental illness. This is just to show people were very happy with my three years of toil and hard work. <laughs> so, <it's good> <laughs> um, so qualitatively, the training was seen as being valuable and worthwhile. Uh, people found it informative, uh, and people were found, found it to be important and 
that it empower them. And this is a finding that you'll see reflected momentarily uh, again. So the, uh, I've mentioned uh, sort of the, the quantitative findings. So what, what then happens is, so I, last week I was at an implementation conference. Um, so Sarah, if you watch this at some point, I learned a new term, the natural lab. So uh, every opportunity I get from now on, I'm gonna say the natural lab. So it's a question of what, taking what we've found and what we've learned and putting it in a natural lab. And that's where the South Africa HIV ATTC comes in. So ATTC is funded by, oh, that's the Addiction Technology Transfer Center, is funded by PEPFAR um, and SAMHSA, uh, and is a partnership between the New England Addiction Technology Transfer Center at Brown University and University of Cape Town. Our goals um, focuses on providing training and technical assistance um, in substance use, HIV, and mental health care to providers, as well as to policy makers. Um, and, so, and so we do this by collaborating with, uh, with government partners at national and provincial level, as well as with US government funded partners who are working in the HIV response in South Africa. The purpose is to strengthen the capacity of the non-specialist worker to identify and address behavioral drivers of HIV outcomes. So to be able to pick up mental health challenges and send people for assessment as required, to pick up uh, substance use disorders and send people for either brief intervention or a referral for additional assessment and treatment as required. So what the ATTC provides is essentially a natural lab so for us to look at when you capacitate uh, community health workers uh, or non-specialist workers on a larger scale, does it improve um, uh, the, the outcomes similarly? What I might say is a concession is that obviously we weren't able to measure uh, client level data. Uh, well, that's quite a complex uh, process. But that's something that, you know, um, when Steve brings me billions, we can start to work towards doing. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so these are the training offerings of our South Africa HIV Addiction Technology Transfer Center. At the end, we'll have a URL if you want to look at what those are all about. But um, in terms of our, what we're focusing on uh, for this particular talk is the mental health training. Just to highlight as well that the activities of the South Africa HIV ATTC are focused in these 27 priority districts. I, I met with someone earlier and I was trying to draw this map, but it turns out, Lewis, I can't draw the map of South Africa. Uh, so I'm, I'm a failed citizen. <laughs> but what this, what this demonstrates is that even though we are based in the Western Cape, in the city of Cape Town, our focus is on those 27 priority districts, which is where the highest burden of HIV is, according so to Pip. Could you go back to this? Yeah. It's like mostly in KwaZulu-Natal? That's right. Yeah. So it's KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, um, Pumalanga, Eastern Cape. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the first year, so we, the ATTC is now two years old, heading into our third year. Uh, so these slides focus on the first year on purpose um, because we, this, this really speaks to setting up uh, uh, an intervention like this in, in, in real terms. Um, and so in the, in the first year, we focused in the Western Cape, you'll see largely because we were fine-tuning fine our, our curricular offerings. And then KwaZulu-Natal was the, the biggest beneficiary of our, of our interventions. Uh, partly because I, I have long-standing relationships with the University of KwaZulu Natal, but also uh, because that's the, one of the areas most burdened by uh, by HIV in South Africa. So what we were able to do in year one in KwaZulu Natal was to deliver 16 training events um, and train uh, 498 folks. For me, the, mo the important bit to take home. So this is pretty crude. This is not. Um, so there's no, in, there's no confidence intervals or anything here. It's just to demonstrate that from a sample of community health workers who had received training in mental health, uh, motivational interviewing and screening and brief intervention, what was the pre and post uh, mm -hmm. behavior. So you can see that following training in mental health, there was improved screening and brief intervention. And in this context, brief intervention would be psychoeducation. So you can see already that there was a significant behavior change uh, for, the, for the providers. What you see is there's a gap in referral to treatment, which is why as ATTC, this part, of, part of our collaboration with our, with our system strengthening partners in KZN is to figure out how do you strengthen the system so that we uh, improve referral to treatment. In fact, you know, one of the gaps at, at, from, from the government side as well is that in terms of mapping, so it's a question of successfully mapping the network and the system to establish 
in what ways you need to strengthen the system once you've got these cadres in place to improve. Because you've trained them where they're going to refer to. So there needs to be a resource either at supervision level or at primary healthcare level for them to send these, card these patients to for assessment. And the system needs to support that. Is the mm -hmm. referral to treatment drop off, like you said, is it because they are they don't know where to send them or there's actually not places to send them? So a combination of both. Okay. Right. So So there's some there is some system development that exists yes. in terms of to, to refer, yes. but it's not yes. either well known to the, the providers yes. to refer or uh, there's just not a lot out there. Look, KwaZulu Natal is actually an excellent province. They've got great systems that just need a little bit of support to strengthen them. So you'll find that as much as the co community setting is well perfused with community health centers, not all of them will have the resources to do uh, advanced mental health screening and initiation of treatment. So that's part of the issue. So the patient goes there, then what? Or it might be that the patient gets the referral but isn't clear on what's expected of them. Uh, you know, again, that, that speaks to the responsibility which you can place on the community health worker. Because theirs would be to psychoeducate and not necessarily to initiate a treatment plan, including go there now and do this. Okay. Yeah. Mm. How, how did you measure referrals? So what we did is, so what we, we actually sent a, um, a, a survey to practitioners who had um, been trained. And we just asked them crudely, you know, how many in the past week have they referred on? Um, how many have they screened for mental illness? How many have they? So it was ex extremely crude. And part of the work we were doing, and which I was talking to Steve about, is right now we're piloting um, MNE processes that will more quantitatively give us an idea of exactly what, what that looks like on the field. Um, playing a bit devil's advocate, with referral to treatment, are they just referring the most severe cases? Um, that's why you're not really seeing the kind of change because I could see people who are not really trained at all pre-training, they should be able to, to identify just the most severe cases, right? Right. And they're referring those. And then after training, they're just still referring only the most mm -hmm. severe. Or the other way to think about it that I'm thinking about it is they're doing this brief intervention and they may be actually helping sure. mild cases mm -hmm. that then don't need to be referred. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in, in terms of the most severe cases, in general if somebody has a severe mental illness and they relapse, they're more likely to be admitted through a more uh, uh, what might be termed as a coercive process. So there might be an ambulance and a police. So that those might go directly to the emergency room as opposed to going via the community health worker. So specifically what we were asking them is their referral behavior with patients that they were seeing. Um, and, and those would generally be common mental disorders and harmful substance use. And or if, some, if, if they spoke to somebody and discovered that this person had uh, some con delusional content or some um, a perceptual disturbance, then that's a recommendation they would need to make to the family. What you're raising here is some of the things that have influenced how we've developed this curriculum. So one of the slides later on will show you what the new curriculum looks like. Because part of the issue we, we face here is that when you're capacitating community health workers, you don't want to give them uh, responsibilities which will add additional burden to them. So in general, community health workers are grade 12, if not below, so they, 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 they don't have any post, uh, post high school training. Uh, they don't really have the kind of psychosocial support at community level that would be ideal. None of us do in actual fact. But you know, when we were initially starting our residency in psychiatry, one of the things that I fantasized about was that we would have routine meetings for therapy, right? To help you deal with the stress of, of, of all the diagnoses and assessments. But we, it's, in reality, it doesn't happen. And much worse for, for non-specialists. So you want to be mindful of, of what you expect of them. So these sort of high-level decisions of um, ad admission, et cetera, would generally be made uh, by their supervisor. But in terms of what they report, they're able to say whether or not they referred that person, be it through their supervisor or through the local community health center for further assessment. But that is a gap. So it wasn't as strong, the, the sort of the assessment as it should have been, right? And so we showed the same pattern for motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting here is that the, 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 the biggest improvement was on the brief intervention side, where now we know how to speak, right? 
So motivational interviewing for me is beautiful because it's not a, an intervention in and of itself. It's a communication style. It's a language. So once you equip somebody with how do I listen and how do I help you navigate your own internal motivations without being the driver, how do I collaborate with you? Uh, we, we see that obviously they, they felt like this is something that I would like to, um, to take on. And the same again for Espert. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I like having them there, and they'll be in the slides afterwards. So we asked uh, providers you know, if they could share an example of how the training has affected the clinical care they provide. He didn't like my answer. So one, one mentioned that um, you know, so one client who had uh, alcohol use disorder, um, you know, it, it's now lower than testing. So they were able to show that because that client was able to tackle their, their harmful substance use, they were then able to be adherent to HIV uh, medication and that they have since become uh, undetectable, which obviously means non-transmissible. Um, and this other provider felt that it helped them to identify affected clients because now they were skilled uh, with tools to do so. Um, what really for me is important here is that this one f understood that substance uh, use disorders were to be dealt by all of us and that it's not uh, a, you know, an, 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 a silo that specific people only are, uh, are there to deal with substance use disorders, but that we can all play a role. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea of feeling a sense of community from being capacitated and understanding that there's more to treatment than just uh, specific interventions. So that was great. And what's great here is that this one was able to say I identified the gap. So to see uh, from in my own community, because these are the people who are actually at the forefront, so I was able to identify the gap in, in the services that they are interface with at the community. Improve my knowledge and counseling skills, and then, I'll, I'll, and then you can look at the rest. So this is the updated uh, mental health uh, training outline. So we've taken lessons from, so this is the beauty of the natural lab. We've been able to iteratively interact with the content and morph it so that it's more responsive to the needs uh, at the ground. One of the most important needs we identified is self-care. So as I was referring to now, we, we, we train these non-specialists in identifying all these disorders and we teach them how to deal with them but uh, very little is, attention is paid to, well, you know, how do they interface with um, this information, th th these disruptions, these disorders. So what you see here is that we've really built in uh, a focus on the provider. So we'll start with, uh, you know, looking at myself, my values, my name, right, as opposed to more broadly focusing only on culture. Yes, you've spoken about culture, but who am I? Right. How do I interface with the world based on my culture, based on my job, based on, you know, my experiences? And we take that and then talk about, uh, we, we, you know, we start low, we start talking about depression. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But what you see at the end of each day is connecting with myself and preparation for day two. And what that, that meant was breathing exercises. So we'd help, uh, we'd, we'd teach them through practice during the trainings to uh, be in the moment, so mindful, mindfulness practice. So each day would start with mindfulness practice and reflection. At lunchtime, there'd be a mindfulness uh, practice, and again at the close of the day. So you are teaching them that even when they are being overwhelmed with content or with new information, sitting and breathing together with others is a way to make you feel less overwhelmed by all of these, these, these experiences and that is, is meant to assist them in dealing with the stresses of, of the work in the field. So these um, sort of the, the, the case studies we used were aligned with the existing primary adult care training in South Africa so that when they encounter another set of training, it's not new cases, it's, 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 a, it's not Dobego but now she's not feeling so well. You know, why isn't she feeling well? She's not sleeping, she's not enjoying being social the way she used to, and so what might be going on? So this allows them to link this with the rest of the training that's offered through uh, National Department of Health. Uh, what you'll see um, on day two, where is it? Oh, it says Spirit of Motivational Interviewing. That's a, I must update that slide, so I must give you a new set of slides to post. 
what, what, what that says is a, a guide on the side, because for this level of cadre, we're not teaching them motivational interviewing, but we're teaching them how to be a guide on the side of the patient, right? So we we'll say to them, what is it about, who do you go to when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed? What is it about this person that really helps you feel supported and heard? Um, and what is, it, what is it about another interaction that might make you feel the opposite? And then we strengthen the focus on those, on those elements that make somebody feel heard. And then talk about how to be a guide on the side based on motivational interviewing uh, principles. Um, so yeah, so the focus here is really on removing the responsibility to fix by capacitating them to be guides on the side, but also providing them with skills to be mindful and to step back from what could potentially be a, a, a very stressful um, circumstance. Oh, you, nearly, you are nearly free of me. Right, so in terms of navigating implementation and, 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 and translating research into the field, in my mind, uh, the things that have enabled us to do this successfully are, is engagement at the outset. Um, you know, you, as, as researchers, we, we, we have a tendency to say, this is what the evidence suggests, and we're bringing this intervention to you, and we think you should try it. So, you know, where can we put it? Um, whereas, in order to not only have um, good buy-in, but to be successful in, because we know things fall apart during research, so in order to have buy-in and everybody at the party to fix and, and, and to tweak, engagement at the outset is absolutely key. And that's what we've always done as um, South Africa ATTC. And it's a continuation of the initial engagements which, which were under my PhD. And then it's really uh, being responsive to that natural lab um, iterative evolution through, the, through collaborations. So to not be a know-it-all, to be okay to not know, and to, to be okay to say, yes, this is what the evidence says, but the stakeholder really is pushing for this. Let me listen to why they're pushing for this, and then see if there's a way to accommodate that. Right? It's, it's easy to be elitist as researchers and say, but no, but this is what the evidence says. So we have to be engaged, iterative, and collaborative with our stakeholders. And of course, you know, doing what you said you will. So if you said you're gonna do a training on the 10th, do a training on the 10th, right? So it, it's about accountability and, and, and being able to, to, to keep, to be true to your word. Um, champions and a strong advisory panel have been instrumental in us uh, in making sure that we're able to deliver the trainings that we have. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, processes which are, which are beyond many of uh, us at intervention level. Um, and so in order to navigate uh, those pathways successfully, it's good to have a champion who can help you um, uh, through those policy and uh, implementation pathways. So some of the challenges that we um, grapple with, uh, and again reflected by some of the conversations I've had with some of your colleagues this morning, is the human resource limitation. So, you know, at the moment, there's quite a high turnover in non-specialist workers. Um, you know, it's, it's not a secure employment. It doesn't pay very well. There's not a lot of incentive. We keep training them and adding burden, but they're not earning more. So it's easy for them to say, actually, I've had it, I'm out of here. So staff retention is a problem. Uh, um, human resource remuneration is a problem. Support of non-specialist workers uh, at, at community level is a problem. Because even though we provide them with now some self-care skills, there's more than that that's required. What's, more, what's required is really a more ongoing support structure that, 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 that is an, a continuous resource for them. So these are some of the gaps that need to be applied again in consultation and through engagement with the stakeholders who supervise and, and are responsible for them. For us, it's the question of a very large site, as I demonstrated in that image. Our team is very small and we service the whole country. Um, and, and so it's about innovation. So part of what we're doing is working closely with training partners who are established in South Africa to cascade the trainings to areas that we can't reach. Um, and so when you receive funding, the, fu the funding comes with conditions. This is what you have to do. We're an implementation uh, organization. Our our mandate is not research. And so what that means is that when you hit the ground running, it's about training and it's about reaching these numbers. So there isn't always space for intensive quantitative formative stuff. 
But this is why relationships and being embedded within universities are so important, because what this provides is an opportunity for academics, postdocs, uh, undergrads, postgrads to have a space to say if they want to come onto the vehicle and do some work, there's, there's a space for them. So these are things we're exploring now. But certainly, um, the, the, the lack of uh, space within funding for research is, is, a, is a limitation for us uh, in terms of how we, we monitor uh, and, and continue to improve our products. And of course, varying levels of implementation across sites. South Africa is um, organized in nine provinces. There is a national government which has national departments who set uh, policy and bills. But each province basically has uh, the ability to uh, roll out uh, policy as they see fit, uh, depending on what they perceive to be the priorities for, for their population and, and, and how they feel the budget should be um, meted out in accordance to that. So the, the varying levels of implementation across sites is a challenge which we've, uh, it took us a while to figure out how to deal with. So you obviously want to work with National to make sure that they're happy with the, with the content of the training curriculum. What, what you then have to do is then go to each province and say, you know, we've got the buy-in at National. How can we uh, address your needs using the materials that we've developed? So that's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's constantly about learning and about navigating the system and, real, and, and realizing and understanding uh, the drivers for why, uh, you know, different provinces and different departments um, adopt things differently. Um, so varying cadre development programs. So it, it, different provinces and different districts train cadres differently. So each province has a regional training center who are responsible for capacitating health workers in their district, but they have different perspectives of how to do it. So not just at provincial level do you have to negotiate, uh, you know, how this could be delivered, you still then have to uh, sort of reach, reach an understanding with the regional training center because they have their own processes. So that's a challenge. Um, uh, again, I, I think that the, the challenge of the uh, varying levels of implementation and, and differing cadre development are, are one and the same. So um, again, good relationships and being trustworthy and engaging uh, honestly and sincerely is, 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 an e is a way that makes dealing with that much easier and I think we've done that pretty well. Uh, I mentioned the tension between, uh, you know, funding in the real world where in, ultimately you, you should have funding that allows you to monitor your, your program. And so if your funding is purely implementation, that's not necessarily um, uh, doable. But at the same time, uh, when you're actually in the field, the challenges and uh, needs that you encounter in the field are often not squarely aligned with the mandate of your funding. So it's a question of figuring out how to leverage uh, your funding to provide that service. You saw all those green areas. That doesn't mean that the gray areas don't have people with HIV. It doesn't mean the gray areas don't have a need for capacitation. So it's a question of being creative about how do you extend the work you do to benefit er areas which are outside of the, manding, uh, the, the, um, the, the funding mandate. And, one way to do that is, is through the regional training centers and through province to make sure that they capacitated to reach out to additional cadres who are not within your priority districts. Um, yeah, and so the other challenge is that, um, so as I mentioned, our main task really is to address the behavioral drivers of HIV risk and clinical outcome. It's hard to prove, isn't it? So if you're able to find somebody who has depression and who, who is on antiretroviral therapy, if their CD4 count changes, I can't prove that it was because we screened them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very difficult uh, in, in, from that perspective on a programmatic level to prove value because the link is not direct. So I think the takeaway, you can exhale now, um, is that <laughs> capacitation of non-specialists is feasible. Um, and that in, in, in the work that we've done, a training of providers has successfully improved detection and early intervention. Some work, significant work is required to improve um, referral to treatment and obviously to clarify what exactly we mean by that and um, on, a, on a practical level. And that policy and implementer participation are key drivers for success. Uh, and that it has to be a sincere engagement, not an el uh, elitist uh, researcher 
who was just pretending to listen, yeah, to actually listen and be responsive to um, the needs of the people you're collaborating with. Thanks for tolerating. <laughs> Some questions. I have a question. Um, you saw some of one of your limitations. You said human resource limitations. I'm not sure if you touched on this, but I'm imagining healthcare workers that are already um, kind of not necessarily paid well, burdened with a, a lot of workload, and now we're asking them to do a, some additional things um, and things that have, are, I'm assuming, are sort of stigmatized things. Um, did you find, um, even though they were, were you, were you able to frame it in a way that it's like, this is expanding your job role, you're doing new things, this is enriching to who you are and what your capabilities are, and you can now reach all these people that have additional needs that you didn't know about and now we're able to do something about it, or is it really, did you get a lot of, I'm so overworked, I'm so overburdened, now there's extra things I have to do and it's the most complex patients. Like, did you get some of, I'm mean, thinking yeah. of our workforce here and we get a lot of that. Yeah. On the front line. So I think, you know, what we had to do was to streamline how we engage with uh, organizations we work with because we, it's a huge, I mean, the site is huge, South Africa is a huge site, so it's, it's not practical for us to, at the outset, always engage directly with providers. So we'll work with the organization. So for argument's sake, uh, KwaZulu Natal is our major collaborator. We'll go to the province and say, you know, you know, where do you need us? What would you like us to do? And they will then mobilize the resource. So when we walk into the training, the resource has been mobilized by a province for us to train. So the providers are in the room. Okay. And so what we learned through that is that sometimes the um, organizations that manage uh, non-specialists are not um, as clear in communicating the expectations and the processes of what will happen during the training as we would like, right? And so we weren't able to address those issues, right? And so what we decided to do was we piloted a, a process where we would collect everyone's cell phone numbers by speaking to their, uh, to their supervising organization. And then we would send them text messages informing them uh, of, of the process, and we'd, we'd send them a link where they can register, because already now you, they're engaging before the training, and that also allows us to get a sense of who they are. So we'd ask things like highest level of education, uh, you know, are you registered with the Health Professions Council? What's your, where do you work? Uh, do you have children? So we were able to get a little bit of demographic data just to characterize them so we can also uh, plan more responsively for the session, right? And at the end of that, we were able to say, uh, do you have any questions, right? And it was an anonymous, so the response would be, the question would be received anonymously, and we would respond by sending the answer to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So we found that that started to uh, address some of those concerns around, you know, what is expected of me? What's going to happen? Do I need to know theory before I come in? So all of those stresses, right? Yeah. The problem was not everybody has a cell phone. Surprisingly. Mm. And not only that, now the form is completed, you need data. In South Africa, data is gold, right? Costs a lot, doesn't last very long, right? So many of them didn't have access to uh, data to be able to complete the form. So what we would do at the beginning of a training is provide a hotspot for them to then use that to complete the form. Mm. But those are, all, those are all issues which, uh, you know, are, are part of the challenge that we face. Um, and I think it probably sounds like a, a cop-out to say it's the responsibility of the, provide, of the supervising organization uh, to ensure that pro providers understand the need for specific training and, and why they're going and what to expect. But what we've done uh, and what we will be really focusing on in the coming year is making sure that when we collaborate with uh, partners on the ground that we're able to impress upon them the importance of alleviating those anxieties by providing that information. And we're able to provide resources uh, to do that. But it hasn't been a focus of ours. Again, because of uh, our funding is do trainings, train people. And so in, in, you know, as we deliver this mandate, it's about how do you uh, add these additional components to meet these arising uh, ancillary needs. And that's something we yeah, we, we, through collaborations, would want to address. 
we use a similar model in Malawi. We have uh, <clears throat> community health workers who are patient navigators in the ART clinics. If uh, people haven't come back for their appointments, they'll go try to figure out why and help them get back and so on and so forth. And we build on that for uh, community health workers to work on early childhood development training. Our, our, one of the problems we've had is that um, our uh, early childhood development community health workers can, can sometimes get poached to work on ART. Yes. So there, we, we go to the clinic and say, well, what's going on? Well, they're all working on keeping people in ART. No, 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 that's not the way it's supposed to work. So it's, it's, it, it also takes some management to make sure that people have, retain their focus and are not poached by other people with other priorities. Yes. Yeah. I think that's uh, especially <laughs> true for um, non-specialists who belong to um, sort of implementation partners who are privately funded uh -huh. or who are US government funded, for example. What's happening in South Africa now is that the South African government is, is looking to hire a cohort of community health workers who will belong to the government directly. And that might help alleviate that sort of poaching because then they have a contract and they have support from, uh, from government and so they have benefits as well. Um, certainly if, you, if you're talking about the NGO space, I mean, if you give me a better offer somewhere else or you tell me that I can do alternative uh, work that will be less stressful for me. Why wouldn't I? Of course, so yeah. it's, about pr it's about considering all of those factors. We just don't have enough money to pay s community health workers what they need to be paid for the work they do. Yeah. So it's a challenge. And that, uh, my comment would relate to both of uh, the previous comments. Based on our experience in Vietnam training community health workers, and. I think uh, my observation, our teams uh, are the content and the format very important and for the intervention to be seen as a, a burden or not. Because community health workers actually they love, they love to learn new skills. Mm. And, and we often yes. focus on it's a burden, it, it, actually they love. Yeah. It's like a framing. It's like yeah. framing. Right. It's like, okay, right. right. exactly. Like the, 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 we got yeah. that a lot. They, sure yeah, so, so right. our, our observation is if you put your intervention in the, in the format that everybody feel they learn something new yes. and, and also help their routine uh, service, they love it. Right. They the love certificates it. help too. But yes, they do. if right. they focus on attitude change, yeah. that is not really that, yeah. you know. I hear you, I hear you. Uh -huh. Receive so, well. So, right. So I think focus on the practical I hear you. So I think when, when we first uh, rolled out the, um, the initial versions of the, of the one of the manual that was um, produced under the PhD, which by the way you can look at. If you send me an email, I can Is send. That the eight session? Yeah, you eight can look at it. It's freely available, so you can go click and look at it. Uh, it's it's the more current one that's not yet publicly available because we're just fine tuning it. Um, what we realized, because we worked in settings where sometimes the power wasn't working or there wasn't a projector, the room was too small to project, we were using PowerPoint at that point. And so we moved away from PowerPoint and started using workbooks. So there was a workbook for the providers and one for the facilitator. And the difference is huge. Now they have tasks, they can color, they can draw lines, they can write and they can have something to reflect on. And that's added a level of excitement which wasn't there before. Um, and certainly, uh, when, when, we, when, we, when we engage with them now, it's really not about saying, how has your attitude changed at all? I think that for, you know, when, you, when you're doing a, a research project for a degree, you have to add you know, certain things. But um, the focus really here is on how capacitated do they feel to perform the duties? And how much, um, how much does the skill assist them in effectively doing you know, there's anxiety associated with not being able to do what you're supposed to do. So to what extent does capacitating them alleviate that anxiety? Yeah, to frame those skill training as yes. part of their life even. Yes. You know, they, a lot of community health workers tell us that the things they learn actually not just help their work, also help their communication yes. with others. So they see the benefit beyond what we, you know, really focus on. So I think that really helps with the sustainability. Yes.
I think that's very important and I want to make sure when I go back to my team that we make that clear as well. It's very important. You know, one thought that I had was I was thinking about that finding on authoritarian or kind of paternalistic views. Um, and have you considered incorporating peers, people with lived experience, into your teaching to address that attitude? Uh, and then the other comment was around the finding on adherence to treatment. And I was wondering if you thought about uh, adapting the training to address pressing or very dire social issues that might be you know, impinging upon their ability to adhere to treatment. Like you mentioned, like, the power might not be on, or if they don't have cell phones, or you know, other dire social transportation systems. Yeah. Um, so you know, that that's that's something that can certainly be considered for the next uh, level of testing of the um, initial task shifting interventions, focusing on M health and and and, and caregivers. Um, I think. Uh, I can gleefully say I haven't had the luxury of being able to return to that study, but at some point I hope somebody takes it further, and those are things that certainly should be discussed in that. I think we've learned uh, from that that psychoeducation is desired, and that uh, clearly when you, when you focus on uh, information around the system, people understand the system better and are able to use it better, so I understand the community health center. So I think additional uh, components focusing on some of those psychosocial and community level issues would be very helpful. You will encounter this, what then? So on a, on a practical level. So I think that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, so if, if somebody watches this at some point and wants to take my study further, I'll send you the, <laughs> send you the citation. Um, and then the, the second question, the first question was about uh, community health workers and... So, right, so when we, when we conduct trainings, we pay the trainers, right? So we have to fund their travel to the training site. We are responsible for their safety when they travel. We're responsible for their sustenance when they travel. Uh, and they are contracted to us as University of Cape Town, ATTC. Um, it would be challenging to achieve that with a, with, so when you say peer, you're saying perhaps a mental health service user who is now stable and can speak from uh, an, you know, a personal perspective. Huge value in that, but it would be under the current model and uh, under the, so sort of, I think there, there would need to be ethical processes that would need to be cleared and, and, and so we, it's not something that we can do at the moment, but I can hear, I can see the value that, that something like that might have. Yeah, I know from the Department of Mental Health in LA County, um, they do, they have developed a sort of peer, but this is run not through the kind of ATTC, but certainly the county has pretty strong capacity to engage mm. people who are stable in their mental illness and utilize them and actually pay them small stipends yes. Yes. and give them a bit of a career path through sort of the county. To yes. be, uh, and it's a pretty good effect, right? Well, they actually looked at, there's um, different disciplines within the county mental health system, which uh, employs me, and there's, there's the psychiatrist, the social worker, and then there's also a division for peers as well. Huh. So it's kind of the, the... And it is true that the, the ethical issues, they go through a lot of training to, there's a, to become kind of ethically proficient at yes. this and, and build skills and yes. things like this. It is, uh, but I think the LA County has done a pretty phenomenal job of trying to tap yes. into you know, a large number of people they've been able to help and who are now stable and, and part of their own recovery is feeling yes. utility and useful. Look, I, I, think, I think that, um, you know, part of what we're looking to really do is strengthen that peer support uh, element for community health workers in the first instance. So to say, so you're all in the field encountering all of this. Let's all talk about how we're grappling with all of these challenges. So that's the one level. On the patient side, um, or on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the side of using um, patients to perhaps as a resource to address these uh, community health workers or to address their peers as well who are also in treatment, um, I think that that is a very useful approach. Um, and you know, it, it, it's something that would fall under that, um, that support group framework or that psychoeducation framework, which I know specifically Kesedon Health is, is actually engaged in, they have uh, some corporate partners where they, they go around the province providing 
uh, information days where peers and, and uh, community health workers and uh, medical practitioners stand up and provide sp specific uh, psychoeducation topics. And I think in that context, uh, the collaborator would be m sort of well advised to use a peer and we would be able to provide support for that. But in terms of training, we wouldn't be able to do that. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. That was great.